Welcome to this conference, which I'll start um, as DHR President David Ha'el with an, a slightly unusual topic. I warmly thank him for his words about the current events concerning the library, <clears throat> and I'm saying so not as chair of this session, but as one of the 90 who signed, um, uh, signed a declaration concerning these matters. <clears throat> um, so now <clears throat> on to Palestina on the map of late antique mobility and migration, <clears throat> um, a subject concerned with volubility and struggle, of course, <clears throat> as we are seeing <clears throat> now in our times. Um, the, um, the, there are two speakers in this session. And the first is Avner Ecker, <clears throat> who describes himself as a classical archaeologist, but I would say he is more than that, given the breadth of his um, activities, a PhD on the rise of the polis in Judea, Palestina, which will come out as a book before long. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then he is uh, a member of a research group which misleadingly is called remapping, but not remapping uh, Palestina, but remapping ancient elites between East and West. Um, and then I'm particularly familiar, familiar with this work um, as part of a team which uh, a, a mixed German-Israeli team which prepares a corpus of the ancient inscriptions in Judea, Palestina. <clears throat> it's a project which is well advanced. It is, we are now um, awaiting the uh, appearance of the fifth volume. There will be seven. Um, <clears throat> and he um, has been active in uh, working on the inscriptions of this country. Uh, <clears throat> in various languages. Um, so, um, so he will now ad address the topic of somewhere old heroes shuffle safely down the street. Um, we look forward to understanding what he means. So first of all, thank you very much for that introduction, Ben. Um, even made me more nervous. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, uh, good morning to everybody, and uh, thank you. I would like to thank Maren Nihoff for inviting me to give this lecture, and I would like to thank uh, Ziva Dekel and Sima Daniel here at the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities for organizing uh, this assembly. The quote in the title, which is just a quote, and the actual title is, of course, Communities of Roman Army Veterans in Provincia Judea Palestina, um, the quote in the title uh, of the lecture is taken from a song, The Gunner's Dream, written by Roger Waters in the Pink Floyd album, The Final Cut. It relates the last thoughts of a Second World War airship gunner shot down over Europe. He's, his dreams are simple. He wants a place to stay, enough to eat, somewhere old heroes shuffle safely down the street, where you can speak out loud about your doubts and fears, and everyone has recourse to the law, and no one kills the children anymore. These words pretty much encapsulate the most basic wishes of any conscript in the rank and file and every veteran, be it in the 21st or 20th century or in the first century CE. Veterans of the Roman army were middle-aged men. By the second century CE, soldiers served 25 years. They were discharged in their 40s and received either a stipend or less often a land grant. Revolts on the Rhine and the Danube in the beginning of the, of the first century, in 14 CE, described by Tacitus in the first book of his Annales, tell us of men that were serving for so long that they were maimed and lashed and lost their teeth and complained that their stipends are either too low or the lands allotted to them upon discharge are uninhabitable remote marshlands. 
Along the first century, coming towards the second, the pay and discharge rights of soldiers was steadily increased and improved. The situation with the armies of Syria and Judea Palestina was considered by ancient authors, authors to be better than those of the East because they were stationed next to cities and thus considered pampered and well treated during service. However, Ben Isaac has shown that they too uh, suffered from hardships of continuous construction work and other activities designed to keep up discipline during peacetime. Surely, upon discharge, they too sought out a relaxed retirement. Now, Roman Palestine was densely occupied by the Roman army. At first, the 10th legion was introduced to, to it by Vespasian, settled in Jerusalem in 70 CE in the wake of the first revolt. We know this. Then, during the reign of Trajan, a second legion was deployed in the province. After some shifts, it, it, eventually became, it was eventually the 6th legion, Ferrata, that was encamped at the mouth of the Jezreel Valley near Megiddo. About 15 auxiliary units were stationed in the province in addition to these legions, and they had approximately the same number of soldiers as the auxiliary units, uh, as the legionary units. So as Werner Eck, from whom I've taken these numbers, points out, a, a circa 20,000 square kilometer province was occupied by circa 20,000 soldiers making it the most densely militarily occupied province in the Roman Empire, with about a soldier per, per each square kilometer. Uh, this force, with considerable, considerable additions, operated during the revolts, of course, during uh, uh, in the reigns of Trajan and Hadrian, and during the rest of the time, as described once more in The Limits of Empire by Ben, yeah, was engaged in pol policing, taxing, and building, in, building in the province. Ideally, that, that is, if all that is, if all that were recruited were to survive 25 years, each year 800 soldiers would be discharged from these units. Eck and others take into account a generous 60% survival rate. That means that about 480 soldiers were released in Palestina each year. Uh, it would be assumed, quite naturally, that many of them would settle in the province or around it, especially, of course, in the colonies of Caesarea and Aele Capitolina. These soldiers, these veterans, are in fact perhaps the, the, the largest group of migrants that we have in the first to third centuries. However, in an article from 2016, Werner Eck examined the documentary and epigraphic evidence for veterans in, the Roman, in Roman Palestine in order to understand whether or not there is evidence for veterans here, and if there is, where did they settle? He found, uh, he found out uh, that of 20 mili 22 military diplomas uh, from between the time of Vespasian up to the time of Commodus, only two were discovered in Palestine. All the rest are from Eastern Europe and the Balkans, where the, the, the auxiliary, auxiliaries originated. Tentatively, this took, he took this to mean that most auxiliaries returned to their homelands after service. Of course, he noted that diplomas are chance finds and that this type of conclusion may be reversed by the archaeologist's spade. He then proceeded to gather all the inscriptions commemorating individual soldiers from the province, divided them dividing them according to language and singling out the veterans. The result of this count was instructive. 14 out of 16 Greek inscriptions were of veterans, and they were mostly found in remote areas in the Golan and the Horan and uh, uh, and, and in the southwestern Syria. Furthermore, 10 or 11 were veterans from units stationed in Palestine. Most Latin inscriptions were found near known military centers or big civic centers, Ela Capitolina, Caesarea, Scitopolis, Emmaus, and Neapolis. Only two belonged to veterans per se. One of these veterans was from a unit that was stationed in Upper Moesia and came over, meaning he did not settle in the province after serving in it. Eck has also shown, based on three inscriptions, that high-ranking officers, tribunes, and primipili settled in Caesarea and Aela Capitolina after service. 
and he concluded, high-ranking officers uh, uh, could afford to live in major civic centers and, uh, that, that could afford uh, uh, to live in major, major civic centers settled there, especially in Caesarea and Aile Capitolina. Second conclusion, that's the one I'm going to contest. The paucity of, of veteran inscriptions in the country and the remoteness coupled with the absence of military diplomas set on, uh, set on the background of de dense military presence in the province indicates that the province was not attractive for veterans. This second conclusion is backed by the work of Oliver Stoll, Stoll um, who mapped the spread of veteran inscriptions in the Near East and had shown that, the, that southern Syria and northern Arab, Arabia have, uh, have been especially settled by veterans. And you can see, uh, we will not go into this, but there are dots on the map and they go, basically go around the Golan Heights and a bit eastwards and, and, and uh, uh, very, as, as far west as we go, the less, less inscriptions we have. The reason for this lack of popularity is not specifically mentioned either by Eck or Stoll. However, it is implied, and one can imagine why, uh, Palestine would be somewhat unpopular among veterans. The Jews of Palestina could have been considered a tad bit hostile to the Roman army. Even long after the Jewish revolts, Amianus Marcellinus uh, claimed that Marcus Aurelius, while visiting Palestina, met, and I quote, the uh, tumultuous and malodorous Jews, and said, oh, Marcomani, oh, Cadio, Saramatai, at last I've met others more quar quarrelsome than you. It is impossible to know if Marcus Aurelius said something like this or not. It is more important that Ma Amianus Marcellinus, uh, the soldier historian, found this statement relevant in the fourth century CE. If indeed the circa 480 veterans released from the military each year did not settle in Roman Palestine, then the Roman army in Palestine was missing one of its most salient cultural agents. But I claim that the conclusions of Eck and Stoll cannot be fully accepted and do not seem to bear out with the archeological evidence that clearly show a country changed by urbanization, especially around military settlements, as already noted by Ben Isaac in his Limits of Empire. I think that even if the epigraphic evidence is not as abundant as we would like it to be, Palestina was a major hub for Roman army veterans, and that eventually, by the third century CE, the country was even welcoming to these veterans. First, one must consider some greater issues. Jewish hostility to the Romans was not consistent nor monolithic. It steadily declined after the revolts. The remaining Jewish lead leaders, as far as we know about them, were those that believed in cooperation with and participation in the empire, most not notably the patriarchs. Second, after the revolts, there, was very, there, there were very good reasons to settle Palestina, since it had and has some of the best lands in the Middle East. The climate is temperate and the location pretty central, snug between Antioquia and Alexandria. It's not a bad spot to colonize. And accordingly, it had quite a few colonies in and around it. Beritus, established by Agrippa, Acco, established by Claudius, and I'm disregarding his provincial borders. Caesarea, established by Vespasian, not necessarily for veterans, and Aile Capitolina, established by Hadrian. I do not count at the moment those titular, titular colonies of the third century onwards. Josephus tells us of 800 veterans settled by Vespasian in Moza, near Jerusalem, later called by locals Colonia, not because it was a, had colonial status, but because Coloni lived there, um, near Jerusalem. This place was recently excavated by the IAA, and, well -planned, and a well-planned neighborhood of similar houses, all built in a row at the end of the first century CE, was discovered. You can see them at the bottom of the, of the slide over here. You can see courtyard one, two, and three, uh, a, row, uh, a row of uh, houses uh, uh, pre-planned and well-built. Um, 
Also, just recently, a significant MA thesis written by IAA archaeologist Liat Maoz described a set of Roman period villas built during the second century along the Rephaim Valley on the way to Eleutheropolis. Legionary brick stamps employed in the civilian construction imported artistic motifs in the Triclinia and the mosaics of these villas, and a Latin inscription on an aqueduct all point to the distinct possibility that these were houses of high-ranking settling veterans. If one pr proceeds to the hinterland of Jerusalem, then one reaches Beit Natif, where the sar sarcophagus of a Roman army veteran and his wife was discovered. But more importantly, one should focus on the city of Eleutheropolis th that may have been built around a Roman military camp. The city received its civic status only in 199 CE from Septimius Severus, but milestones from Jerusalem measured the distance to the place even before the city was established. And an amphitheater for gladi gladiatorial games was constructed on the spot already or before the time of Commodus, as proven by an altar that was discovered within the amphitheater. Finally, remains of a possibly military fort was discovered just north of the city. All these point to the presence of soldiers at Eleutheropolis and the foundation of the city for the veterans who dwelt there. Even the name Eleutheropolis and its Aramaic form Bedjibrin, House of Men, seems to hark back somehow to discharged soldiers. The case of Eleutheropolis is instructive in regards to the use or abuse of documentary evidence for the location of veterans and the measure of their impact on Palestina. All evidence point uh, towards the foundation of this city due to military presence at, at its proximity. Eventually, it was a major town, possibly having the largest territory in the province, bordering the ter territories of Gaza and Ashkelon on the, uh, on the west and extending down to the southern tip of the Dead Sea in the east. In its territory, one finds rural villas, very similar to those discovered in, the, in close vicinity to Jerusalem. Yet, despite all this, the city did not produce even one veteran's inscription. This lack of inscriptions is troubling, but it is not sufficient to contradict all other evidence. To complete the argument regarding the introduction of veterans into the heartland of Judea and their impact on the country, one, one, one can outline a certain development. At the end of the first revolt, Vespasian gave polis statuses to Sepphoris in the Galilee and to Neapolis in Samaria. By doing so, he ended the toparchy system in, in these regions. He left the toparchy system in Judea without establishing a city in Jerusalem. It is as if he left the problem for later generations. He did, however, signal that Judea should, should eventually fall under urban territories like the rest of the provinces. He did so by settling his 800 colony near Jerusalem. Sixty years later, Hadrian picked up on Vespasian's trail and because of, veteran, of the veterans there, established the colony in Jerusalem. He thus signaled the end of the toparchy system in Judea. Finally, Septimius Severus, 70 years after Hadrian, established Eleutheropolis, once more responding to the presence of veterans and availability of lands after the Bar Kochva revolt. Together with Eleutheropolis, Lida Diospolis uh, was founded, and soon afterwards, Emmaus Nicopolis. With, the, with, these found, with this foundation of Emmaus Nicopolis, the, the circa 500-year-old toparchy system in Judea became extinct, preserved perhaps only in the Pariah. And all this most, uh, most probably because of the presence of military and its veterans who left few if inscriptions, if any. It is quite obvious then that one of the major effects of the Roman military in, and its veterans in Judea was urbanizations with all, with all its corollaries, theaters, temples, big bathhouses, etc. Also, we may understand how rare veterans' inscriptions are in the region. It is not clear why, but one may suggest that, first of all, unlike the necessity to state that one is a soldier, one need not state that he is a veteran on his tombstone. Second, if many of the recruits were from the Near East, as their Greek epitaphs hint, then perhaps the absence of inscriptions reflects a typically lax epigraphic habit. In fact, even the known cemeteries of soldiers have su su surprisingly few inscriptions. Yotam Teper excavated a Roman military cemetery near Akko. It, it was composed only of men, uh, more than 100 male uh, burials, and found only one epitaph. 
He and Matthew Adams have, ex have been excavating the cemetery next to the Roman legionary camp in Legio, where more than 30 deceased, uh, either inhumed or cremated, were discovered, and only one epitaph so far discovered. So, the few veterans inscrip inscriptions listed by Werner Eck are precious te testimony to many more veterans, and not testimony of a precious few. We take this conclusion and move northwards, so, so to speak, into the lion's den, as it were, and check the Galilee. Every student of Roman Palestine has heard that after the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Jewish center moved from Judea to the Galilee. This second and third century Galilee was predominantly Jewish and supported two developing urban centers, Tiberias and Sepphoris. Three veteran inscriptions were discovered in Tiberias, a, a city noted as a Jewish city in ancient sources. One, and you can see these, these are from the fifth volume of, this, of the corpus, uh, by the way, that's upcoming. One veteran born in Dora Europos, who served in the sixth legion. One who served in the 10th. And one who was probably a native of Tiberias and was a decurion in an unspecified unit. A tradition in the Babylonian Talmud speaks of Rabbi Uda, the patriarch, asking the, an emperor, Antoninus, to give Tiberias the status of a colony. A 10th century source from the Cairo Gniza calls this city a colonia. But there is, most importantly, no numismatic evidence for this status. Coins of Tiberias were minted up till 222. It is possible that Tiberius received, and this is a, a thought, the name Colonia in the Cairo Gniza because a part of the city, city received Coloni, like Colonia near Jerusalem in Moza, uh, okay? And not because it changed a status. Now looking at Sepphoris, until recently, all 18 inscriptions from the Sepphoris Cemetery have been known as Jewish inscriptions. Recently, a photograph of an inscription that was discovered in the Sepphoris necropolis surfaced in the Israel Antiquities Authority archives. It is an epitaph that mentions Gaius Julius Paulus, a veteran. Now, we have veterans in both major cities in the Galilee. It is probable that Julius Paulus was a Jew, just like the rest of the deceased in the cemetery. There is no need to check a lexicon of Jewish names to prove that Paulus was a name used by Jews in the Roman period. It is also possible that the other veterans in Tiberias and, uh, uh, were Jews as well, just like most deceased in the Tiberias Cemetery. There is also no need to over-problematize the issue of Jews serving in the Roman army. But for this present lecture, it is not very important if these veterans were Jews or not. What is important is that these discharged soldiers found the cities of Tiberias and Sepphoris welcoming and allow us to include the Galilee in the realm of veteran settlement. All these inscriptions are from the second or third century. They are from the time that both cities enjoyed a boom in construction, a time where both cities built pagan temples in their midst, accompanied by lavish villas decorated with mosaics Eastern, influenced from Eastern and Western styles. The Eastern side of Sepphoris, built up during these century, centuries, even sports a rather rigid orthogonal grid. And the closest parallels to its agora are from Italian towns. This is not to say that the city was a military colony. No, 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 of course. But rather that military architecture influenced its plan more than it did other cities in the region. If one then sums up the areas where veterans are found in the region, then one can point to Judea, the Judean lowlands, Samaria, the coastal region, and Caesarea, or, uh, uh, and the Galilee. And one can further include the Peraya if one takes into account a papyrus from 151 CE documenting a veteran who received a land grant there. If one veteran received, received a land grant in the Peraya, surely others did as well. Also, one can include Gadara, which was part of the province and has several inscriptions of veterans in, in, in the, that place. Finally, of course, as I already noted, the Golan and its vicinity had many rural locations where veterans are attested. 
More importantly, one can discern two types of veteran settlement and impact. In the Golan and its vicinity, the rural areas, veterans settled in farms or small villages, and, men, and, and in the mainland of Judea Palestina, they settled in the cities. And there is evidence for veteran settlement not only in Jerusalem and Eleutheropolis, but also in Tiberias and Sepphoris, as I just said. In the heart of the Jewish Galilee, these veterans were, in some cases, generators of urbanization processes, such as the case in Jerusalem and Eleutheropolis, and also Maximianopolis in the Jezreel Valley, which I did not mention uh, uh, in this lecture. They were also members of existing urban communities and may have contributed significantly to the transformation of Jewish polis into fully-fledged Greco-Roman polis. The higher-ranking officers are also the ones who left the epitaphs in the city necropolis. It is, uh, it is evidence that veterans settled in most areas of the province and Palestina between the 2nd and 4th centuries was in no way hostile to them. In fact, the veterans enjoyed a respectable life. And as Amandus, a veteran, a veteran from Tiberias, put it in his, in his epitaph, he enjoyed a luxurious life and the love from his city. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Avner, uh, for this um, uh, lecture, which did two things. It explained the title, and it, I think it's, uh, it's a persuasive uh, presentation of uh, many facts that are seemingly unconnected. I would like to, uh, before we start, before I ask you to um, encourage or uh, destroy Avner, uh, <clears throat> I will uh, uh, raise a few points. There's one that I think has not been mentioned by Werner or by, by other scholars, and that's the importance of local recruitment. Local recruitment is a phenomenon that has been researched very well by the late John Mann in a book. Um, uh, it is not something you can e trace easily, but it, it undoubtedly existed. If you have, um, uh, if you have 5,000 soldiers based uh, in the uh, Israel Valley and a similar group in uh, what used to be Jerusalem, then those uh, thousands will have had children and they might very well join the army. And where did they settle in the end? They were born in, <clears throat> in Judea, Palestina, and uh, they grew up there and served in the army. So they must have been there. Um, <clears throat> And second, um, the, there is the randomness of the epigraphic evidence, as those of us who've worked on the corpus of inscriptions from this region know very well, there's the randomness. Take the example of Mozza, which uh, um, Avner mentioned. We know of this thanks to a literary source, rather random source, which is Flavius Josephus. Um, <clears throat> take the um, uh, the other case of Eleutheropolis. Uh, we know there was a military base there, but not from a personal inscription by a veteran. It is a general inscription which uh, mentions a, uh, a military camp, and there is much more like that. So. I would say there is, um, uh, you can't check the inscriptions from a certain area and then count a specific type of inscriptions and say this has statistical relevance because it doesn't. It, what has survived is a matter of chance. There are many more inscriptions discovered in this region than there are in uh, my native Holland. And that's a matter of, uh, of 
physics. I mean, if there's less stone there to produce inscriptions, and the stones there were, were easily reused or they were lost in the clay. So <clears throat> there is the combination of uh, random, uh, random survival of evidence, uh, and there are complicating factors, which I would like to mention as the, the fact that you know that all those thousands of legionaries in Ilia Capitolina must have had children, and some of them must have served in the army, even if they didn't leave our, as our, their inscriptions. So thanks, and now whoever has something to say, you're welcome to, to do so. Can you say a bit more about the linguistic impact of these uh, settlers, if you like, assuming that Aramaic would be the working class language, as it were, and Greek would be a better language. And these were presumably either Latin or other speakers in many cases. And so what, uh, what was the social impact of that? Uh, I think, first of all, that by the time uh, that we're talking about the, the, in, the income of the, the incoming legions, um, Greek has already been uh, entrenched in, in the region. From, let's say, from the third century BC onwards, we can see it uh, uh, in increasing use, especially as the public language or the, the, the language of law and, and, and inscriptions. So uh, in, in that kind of sense, I, um, I don't think that the, that the veterans brought with them uh, the, the use of Greek uh, uh, into the public realm, but they may have very well been uh, uh, Greek speakers on their own, on their, in their homes. But if we're talking about local recruitment, they may also have been Aramaic speakers and start, just used Greek in their epitaphs. I think that the distinction uh, between uh, the Latin epitaphs for serving soldiers and Greek for veterans is, is telling, uh, is, is very telling, and uh, that indicates that these soldiers are actually from the East. And, and uh, I don't think, ah, I'm sorry, uh, uh, are actually from the East and not uh, uh, and, and did not uh, uh, bring with them a foreign language into the, uh, into the milieu of uh, Judea Palestina. Latin, of course, didn't catch on as, uh, as much as uh, uh, we'd like it. <laughs> uh, and I think Oz will have something to say about that. But, um, uh, and it generally is the language of administration and uh, of, of within the Roman realms and did not break out. Actually, that's the interesting thing is that serving soldiers uh, used Greek to communicate with locals. We can see that in papyri uh, of, of a, a, money, a, a loan uh, between a soldier and, a, and uh, somebody who lived near uh, Jerusalem in around the beginning of the t second century. Um, thanks, Avner, for a really interesting paper. I'm, I'm struck by the um, agape, the love of, for the, for the uh, veteran that he himself commemorates. Is, do you have any evidence what may have been expressions of love for the, uh, from, from the, I mean, <laughs> is there any, any evidence to flesh this out? Uh, first of all, no, not that I know of, to be honest. Um, it is a metrical inscription, so, uh, so the, 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 the agape, Agapen fits there <laughs> very well. Um, and he has to say something about the relationship between him and his city. And uh, these, kind of, uh, these kinds of relationships are relationships of, uh, of uh, honorifics. He could, be the, uh, he could be some kind of a local elgetes and, and receive uh, whatever honors from, from the city itself and, uh, and be well respected, actually. And, and this could be interpreted in a poetic setting as, as love. Yeah. Then, would you choose for me? <laughs> Thanks for the, oh, for the paper. I'm also quite struck by the phenomenon of local uh, recruitment. So I was also curious you know, to know more about the, maybe um, how was 
you know, how, how, what, how was that phenomenon perceived in local population and how, how might that phenomenon also contribute to set, set some light also on, on figures like Josephus, you know, and, and this whole going to the Roman ban? Well, uh, I think that uh, in the case of, of, of local recruitment, and I'm, I'm very happy that, uh, that uh, you brought this up, in, um, and um, there are two types of factors. Uh, one is, of course, the, the children of soldiers that were settled here, and uh, some were legally born, some were illegally born, but uh, eventually um, uh, they could have been soldiers themselves. Um, and the other is um, the transfer from... The, the, the armies of the Hashmonian dynasts, uh, from, from uh, the armies of Agrippa, the first and the second, into, uh, into the Roman army, uh, uh, once these dynasts uh, 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 ceased to rule. Um, I think it's an, a unit of Samaritans, if I remember correctly, that, uh, that transfers, uh, that we first find under Agrippa the first, and then we find it as an auxiliary unit uh, um, uh, in the Roman army. So there is a military tradition, a local military tradition, a Jewish local military tradition, or, or just a, you know, under the Jewish kings, um, that, uh, that is cooperating with, with the Roman army throughout the, second, throughout the first revolt. We know this for sure. Um, and uh, so, so joining the military, whatever military there is at the time, uh, is, is not, nothing new. Uh, it's just uh, uh, serving one master instead of the other. Um, so, so in that, in that case, um, once... Just interrupt you. Mm -hmm. uh, of course you're right, but there still is a distinction between the Jewish army there's a difference between serving as a Jew in the second century uh, BC and serving in the Roman army. In the Roman army you served for 20, 20 or 25 years as a professional and that is not necessarily the case with the Hellenistic armies. And, and that is, of course, a, a major difference, um, but uh, uh, as, as a tradition of soldiering does exist. Um, so that, that is what I can uh, say uh, about uh, um, uh, local recruitment. We do not have numbers uh, or any kind of uh, 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 way of directly measuring, quantifying uh, this. Uh, other than also saying that what is local, you know, if, if somebody is uh, from the Near East, is from Dura Europus or from uh, from Palmyra, uh, that is also in a in a general sense local. Um, so uh, uh, the, the army of the East, in many cases, is is, is uh, manned by uh, Easterners. That's uh, what I can say. I hope this kind of answers the question. Thank you for this fascinating talk, um, which shows the limits of numbering evidence. The lack of diploma, military diplomas could be explained by the fact that there was, were many people after Romans who could use the metal, in contrast to the Balkans, who would melt down the, the military diplomas and so they disappeared for us. And on the other hand, um, we have a, still a relatively small number of inscriptions of veterans, or more precisely, inscriptions of people who identify themselves as veterans. And I think um, we should consider the different epigraphic habits, which differed from region to region, as we know. And it would perhaps make sense to compare the situations in Judea with other regions in the Roman Empire with differing ways of expression, of expressing, expressing your reputation. For example, in <clears throat> the Germanic provinces, you couldn't have much more than being a veteran. But in Judea, there were other opportunities to gain reputation. And perhaps this might explain the difference between the regions as well as the other factors. Thank you. Mm. Yes, uh, I, uh, I uh, absolutely agree. And there are, um, uh, and there are also 
you could see this, uh, for instance, if you search for the word uh, veteran, veteranus, or in, in uh, Roman inscriptions from Britain, in RIB, you find 40 inscriptions. And, uh, and there were no less soldiers there than, and, than here, and, and somebody had made a choice. Um, I, I, can't, I can only agree. And as for the diplomas, by the way, uh, there are many more diplomas from the province of Syria, for instance, and none were discovered in Syria. So uh, uh, we would not say that there are no v veterans in Syria. There can be, and I'm continuing this part because this has been a, a thought of mine that I didn't put into the lecture because I'm not sure of this, but there could be a, also a chronological uh, uh, distinction here. The diplomata are from uh, the reign of Vespasian up to the reign of Commodus. They are of veterans who actually fought in the revolt. Uh, they may not have wanted <laughs> to, to settle here, uh, and the, the inscriptions are somewhat later. We don't have exact dates, but we know that they go into the third century, even the beginning of the fourth. So it could be also uh, be a different point in time where, uh, where these auxiliaries and, and legionaries uh, leave the, the country uh, uh, in, the, in the earlier period, and then the other uh, discharged veterans in later times actually settle in it. So one more question. Benedict? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Afne, illuminating as always. Um, I just wanted to briefly point out that you entitled this communities of veterans, but as far as I can see, you have not shown any inscription that has more than one veteran in it. And it seems to me that this is one distinction between your material and what you have around Bosra and in Patanea, Trachonitis, all of that, where we see not only more veterans, but also veterans working together on certain things, such as uh, building a temple or, or these other, you know, the material from IGLS, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And elsewhere, of course, in Ostia, we have a Corpus Veteranorum, for example. So would you say that is just coincidence as well, or is it perhaps the case that not, you know, it's not just the number of veterans that makes a community of veterans, and especially if there is a recruitment uh, on a local level, these people might then celebrate their status, but they don't act, veterans, it doesn't create community in, in any meaningful way. Well, it, this is a, a general problem with the inscriptions somehow uh, west of uh, the Jordan River, uh, that uh, they, uh, uh, they do not list very many uh, institutions to be, and of course there are inscriptions from North Africa mentioning veteran communities. So I am, once more, the, the, the epigraphic, habit, uh, epigraphic uh, uh, evidence is lacking. Um, my assumption is that if there is, mo if there is one, there are others. Um, and that they did not disperse into uh, individual uh, units and that they felt welcome. This is why I actually brought Amandus because it was the only thing that is somehow close to refer to his surroundings. So uh, uh, that is uh, one case. Uh, in fact, the, the inscription from, uh, fr from uh, Sepphoris may be uh, uh, for the burial of a sister of the veteran, but the reading is not very clear. And from around Moza, we found there is an inscription of a four-year-old uh, uh, infant or, or child that, that is buried uh, using uh, Latin. So, so, so there, are, there is some kind of evidence for, uh, uh, for, uh, for families. An intriguing uh, uh, document, a uh, uh, diptych or a triptych, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plaque. Um, it's a wooden plaque from Alexandria, dated to 98 describes uh, uh, several veterans from the 10th Legion in Alexandria that combined together ask for uh, citizenship for, the, uh, th for their children born during service. So we can see that they immigrated actually from Palestine to Alexandria as a group and not, uh, not, uh, as, uh, not alone. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you.